Hello everyone, my name is Josh Hacko and this is Nicholas Hacko, my father. And uh, today we're talking about all things watchmaking and all things Nicholas Hacko watchmaking. Stands for? <laughs> what it stands for, us as a brand. But specifically, we're going to talk about the Mark I. And uh, a little bit of a backstory. Three or four weeks ago, we did a live stream on our birthday. It was our eighth year of uh, Rebelde and NHW. Um, and it was, I guess, a really successful event. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. We got hmm. over 700 uh, uh, views on uh, uh, YouTube, which is a massive amount, <laughs> taking consideration that the video went for an yeah. hour and a half almost. So. That's right. And it was on a Sunday as well. We live streamed on a Sunday, so uh, it wasn't truly accessible to everyone on the live stream. But in saying that, all the people on the live stream their first kind of response was, when are you going to do a next one? And we didn't even really anticipate to do another one. We just wanted to do one on our birthday. But we decided, why don't we do something else about the second part of our story and maybe the third? And, and, answer, so and answer some questions. Mm. Some of our viewers ask, uh, hey, I got the ideas myself of starting a brand, of making a watch putting a watch together, I want to start my own watch business, any tips? And I think this is an opportunity now to answer maybe some of those questions, mm. uh, basically to tell our viewers what went wrong mm. during our project and uh, hopefully they will learn from our mistakes. I never like saying that I'm an expert. We're not. I think, I think you're a bit more of an expert when it comes to a lot of things than I am, but well, how old are you? <laughs> a lot younger than you. How old are you? 22. 22. Well, I'm 57, so <laughs> there should be a little bit of respect there that way. But, but uh, I'm not an expert, but I've made a lot of mistakes. Okay. So that's, that's the easiest way to assert some sort of... Um, yeah, credentials. Credentials, yeah. All mistake. right, so, so how do you get into watch making, meaning starting your own brand? What are you setting up yourself for? Oh, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, number one, watch is a very sophisticated product. So if you are thinking of designing and making a very, very sophisticated product, then you have to plan carefully, I say, uh, also to be prepared to go for a long run. But you are setting yourself for a major project it's not easy no it's not easy definitely not easy i think even if you don't attempt to manufacture anything to actually make anything from raw materials starting your own watch project is one of the more difficult things that you can do yeah and and there are, there are a number of ways of how you get into having your name on your watch uh, the most traditional way the most re revered ways what we call George Daniels way. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> yeah, of course. It's where you manufacture, where you assemble and you adjust and you do everything as a sole watchmaker by hand. And so that, what does that mean by hand? Well, it's up, up to interpretation, but you are, I think the, the focus is that you are as the watchmaker, the sole maker of the watch in the same way that a knife maker you know, uh, takes the raw material and forges it and creates a blade and a handle and all the rest. And he's the sole maker of that piece of art. So basically from raw material to a masterpiece. Correct. Yeah. And that requires a fair bit of skill. So what, like maybe 30 years behind the bench repairing watches? I first. So, yeah. I think that's, without that, you really have no chance. Well, George Daniels was a, a watch repairer for yeah. decades for before yeah. he started making correct and uh, i think this is this is a component that's always Missed. unfortunately yeah. overlooked uh, he was genius uh, george Dan J daniels was a, a mechanical genius but it took him a long 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 time before he became an expert uh, in a field expert horologer Horologist, horologer. <laughs> uh, and what kind of watch George Daniels 
made. Well, it, it's a one-off, you know. That's it, right. It's, it's not... I mean, he did make, a, what, more than 10 watches I, in his I think lifetime? 10 to tw between 10 and 20, depends who you... Yeah. Yeah. And none of them were really the same watch many times. It, I, I, I'm not an expert on George Daniels, but at the same time, I can tell you for free that it won't, he wasn't making hundreds of watches. No, he was making a few watches, almost every single watch, the prototype, yeah. and George wanted to uh, became famous watchmaker following his idol, Louis Breguet, and uh, he succeeded. Mm. But we're talking watches that, that now sell for a million dollars each. So mm. it takes years, maybe a couple of years to make George Daniels watch, and you're targeting market a clientele that has a spare million dollars. Mm. Yeah. And funny enough, there are people out there who are very passionate about following uh, George Daniels method and they want to be next George Daniels. And I say good on them. Yeah. That's very ambitious. But I wouldn't suggest that you start there. On the other side of a spectrum, you have mm. your Filippo, <laughs> Giorgino, <laughs> Loretino <laughs> brands. And I'm, I mean, I, yeah, it is. What do you mean by that? What What I mean by that is you go to Hong Kong watch fair uh, where you see hundreds of Chinese watch manufacturers who make mass produced watches. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 10, 20, 30 dollars wholesale. And you pick the models there on a fair and say, I want 100 of this and 100 of blue and 300 chronographs and uh, they will be more than happy to put your name on it, mm -hmm. whether it's your name or made up name. Most commonly it's a made up name. And in a six to 12 months, watches arrive to your warehouse and then your, your, your marketing campaign already started. Uh, and and this, is, this is how it's possible nowadays to uh, bypass the middleman. Mm -hmm. So you, the guy who goes there, put your money into, uh, into a watch. And then uh, you're clever, you, you know how to use the marketing tools, uh, you know how to promote yourself on Instagram and Facebook online, and yeah, it's success. It works. I guess so, but you can sell a lot of watches. So you can sell hundreds and thousands, tens of thousands of watches. But what's the downside? Because if, if it was perfect... Well, downside is you cannot call yourself a watchmaker. Yeah. Because that watch, those watches are made in China by robots, by unskilled labor who puts together, you know, battery operated quartz junk watches. I have to say junk watches together. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, if you're on a market, you want, you're looking for, for a cheap watch, you know, to give it to a kid, five years old kid, 10 years old kid. That's fine. But you can't call yourself a watchmaker. Mm. All right. So lots of Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. crowdfunded campaigns resulted in projects like this where a lot of number of brands make a lot of money so if, if you really want to make money I said that's the way to go <laughs> probably yeah yeah if I, your goal is to sell a lot of watches you're very good at marketing yes yeah you want to make money I say don't waste your time with anything else go to Hong Kong it, and China you're right it's it's um it's not a watchmaker's pursuit. It's a marketing pursuit. It's something. It's something someone out of university who studied marketing would, 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 spend their time on. So we've got George Daniels, and we've got the kind of Kickstarter Hong Kong project. Yep. What's in the middle? Because those are two extremes. Well, well, the, there is not much in the middle. There is not much in the middle. Uh, there is. There are. There are brands, small brands, watchmakers who are working hard uh, to establish themselves. And this is what we do. We're working hard to establish ourselves. But before you kind of jump into it, you have to be very careful and spend a lot of time planning and setting up your goals. Where do you want to be? Clearly, you don't want to sell $100 or $200, $300 mm -hmm. watch. Clearly, you don't want to sell $1 million watch. So you have to be somewhere in between, between $100 mm -hmm. and $1 million. <laughs> Where do you want to be? Mm. Yeah? Where do you want to be? This is the first question you, you have to answer. Who, is, who else is competing in that uh, price band, in that segment? Uh, we, we set our goals with, uh, with our project. Um, 
And I can talk about Mark One. That was not our first watch. We already mm. had a, a Rebelde a line of watches where we design external components, we design the case, we design the dial and hands, and then we order Swiss movement. It was based on 6497, 6498 ETA, UNITAS. So we already had a watch. We had that watch, Rebelda watch in um, stainless steel case. We had it in titanium. We had it 18 karat gold. But it was a very, very simple. Well, maybe I can, if you haven't seen it. No, no up here. Up here. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a very pretty much straightforward. It's a Panerai looking watch. And a lot yeah. of people say, oh, that looks like another Panerai uh, with a twist and six, seven years ago, that's where the market was. And, mm. uh, but it wasn't, our attention was not to copy Panerai. Our attention was to uh, offer a watch that will help us establish ourselves based on the three important things for us. That was for a watch to be robust, reliable, and repairable. And we set ourselves in the price range about, we started with $1,500. Uh, we quickly found that about two and a half thousand Australian dollars, which is about 12, 1500 US dollars is, is, is right market to be in. Um, it will enable, it enables us to sell in a certain volume. Um, and to provide an honest product where what was assembled by a watchmaker, a watchmaker. Mm. That's right. So we had an established, Line. Line. Yep. And we were, I guess, with the Mark One, we were venturing into a little bit more of a different type of watch. Yep. Well, that, that's how Mark One looks like. Mark One is a, a 40 mil case, 40 mil case, uh, stainless steel, uh, automatic, sweeps hand, sends hand, uh, with a date, with a calendar. Mm -hmm. So we offer something. <clears throat> it, it was an addition to existing line. Uh, not everyone like 44 and 45 mil uh, case size watch. This is 40 mil, much more comfortable for, for, you know, if you have a smaller wrist, it was a perfect watch. It's a unisex watch. So mm -hmm. we sold a number of those watches to ladies. But we, we, we set, it wasn't just for size. It wasn't, we didn't start Mark 1 project because we just needed 40 mil watch with a calendar, automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, we started for, for different reasons. And we set our expectations with this project high, maybe even higher with the, with, the, with the first batch. So what was the reason? Why did we start it? Well, I, I, I really wanted Mark 1 to pass three tests. Okay. The first test is rubbish bin test. Okay. Uh, rubbish bin test is, imagine, you know, a uh, hundred years from now, someone is going to a uh, drawer and finds bits and pieces that belong to grandfather and uh, family members, and he he goes and picks something like 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 this, and he goes, oh, what is this? It's a mechanical watch. Yep, uh, it was made in Sydney. It's got a maker's name on it. Uh, it's got 67 Castlereagh Street, Sydney on it, engraved on a case back. So immediately he would know that he's dealing with something that is uh, that is uh, well made. And it has some meaning, has a story behind it. Uh, immediately he would say, oh, I like this. And what is this? He would be at least curious enough not to throw it away in a rubbish bin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if he's smart enough to do a bit of research himself, he would quickly discover that that watch was made by someone who claimed to be a, a first watch manufacturer and a brand in Australia. Mm -hmm. And that watch will not be thrown away. So, so the watch has to be of certain quality and properties to survive that rubbish bin test. So it will never get thrown away. It will never be, get thrown away. Mm -hmm. and, and think of it for, for a moment. If, if you find that in, you're going through estates, uh, you know, and, and through a pile of of, of uh, goods, you know, and you find a nice handmade knife, mm. chef's knife, yeah. You're never gonna throw that away. You're never going to throw no. that away. Or a piece of jewelry, or gold mm -hmm. ring, or anything with a maker's name on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
but it has to be a real person. Mm -hmm. It cannot be Loretto or Loretti made up name. Mm -hmm. It has to be a real person. Okay? I I'm thinking of Tansu knives. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. If I find like if I have that knife in my drawer and that you know hundred years from now somebody goes through my drawer, my safe deposit box, I want him to find that knife. Yeah. I want him to find a nice Omega Moon watch from mm -hmm. 1969. Mm -hmm. And if there was a Mark I made by Nicholas Hacker in Sydney, a sample design, why not? That that would be a good company to be in. Mm -hmm. So that was that rubbish bin test. The second test, I wanted my Mark I to pass watchmaker's test. Which is? Which is simple. If you take Mark I with my name on it to any watchmaker mm. anywhere in the world, yeah. today or in a hundred years from now, that watchmaker will look at it and say, well, that's a cool watch. And I've heard maybe or maybe not of this guy and I can look him up. And But the watch itself would be a testimony to watchmaking, to mm -hmm. horology. Mm -hmm. So it will be worth something as a, as a timepiece. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It will stand on itself, by itself. And to me, this is very important. And because this is how we judge watches today. If you come to our workshop and you have a watch that you found... A pocket watch, hundred years mm -hmm. old pocket watch. I look and say, "Oh, this is fantastic! It's a, it's a, it's a railway pocket watch. It was built to serve a purpose, but there is a story behind it." Maker is maybe no longer in the business, mm -hmm. but the quality. You look at the quality of the chatons. Look at the uh, the hairspring. You look at the uh, the finishes on a, on a bridges. Timeless qualities. But there's an interesting point to draw from that. You mentioned all the physical characteristics of the movement, so maybe the finishing and how the movement is assembled. But there is another layer, which is also, um, I guess, very important to note. It's not always about the movement, because you can put a really nice movement, like a Voscher movement, in a really crap watch, and it will not pass the watchmaker's test. But we don't know which watch will pass watchmaker's test. That's right. Well, sorry, we don't. We know which watch will pass watchmaker's test, but we know we don't know which watch For will sure. pass test of time correct yeah because brands come and go yes so what you mentioned though was that it was let's say this hypothetical watch that we were judging was a railway watch mm. now it being a railway watch is in itself something that marks it as special different unique all the rest it's not necessarily just the um the movement finishing because there's a story there's a there's some sort of character behind the watch that uh transcends the time that it takes for it to be made and so on and so on. So in that case, what, what I'm really trying to say is that if, if you put together all the elements of a, what, what is supposed to be a nice watch and you just put them together, that's not a foolproof uh, recipe for that watch to withstand the test of time. Um, you need to have really a brand. You need to have some sort of uh, recognition past the watch as, a, as an entity itself. Well, again, perfect example, for example, Breitling Navi Timer. Mm -hmm. is, is, that's the model that I'm really only interested in Breitling. That's, to me, this is the only Breitling that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it is, to me, this is what Breitling stands for. A pilot's chronograph. A complex pilot's busy mm -hmm. dial. Busy that, that's yeah. what, you know. If, you, if you're looking for a diver's watch from 1950s or 60s, 60s rather, I say Rolex Submariner. That, that, to me, this is a good Rolex to have. And if I collect Rolex watches, I would collect Submariners, vintage Submariners. Uh, I wouldn't collect Datejusts. I wouldn't collect Presidents, which are mm -hmm. far more expensive, but that iconic, you know, so, so but to get to that iconic level is very incredibly difficult. difficult. It's, it's incredibly yeah. difficult. So I probably wouldn't even worry about this no, at no. all. The third thing that I wanted Mark I to be is to fit in our philosophy of our brand and of our project. And there is, I have to, <laughs> there is a, a, a very well-known YouTuber who goes, this is a great philosophy. And I, I'm not making fun out of way how people pronounce, you know, English words. I come from non-English speaking background and I'm not uh, mocking him at all. On contrary, 
I like how he said philosophy because I always think there is something to be filed <laughs> and, okay. and, and preserved, you know. So the, the right. philosophy <laughs> is more than philosophy. Philosophy is, <laughs> philosophy is mental thing. You think of it, it's a great idea. This is that. But philosophy is taking the philosophy to material <laughs> level. Okay. And I love that. I mean, I, I, if I can have a copyright on that, <laughs> I would love to. So, so what is uh, our, our brand philosophy? Our brand philosophy is that we're looking, we, we keep asking ourselves constantly that question, what would happen in 100 years from now? Mm. We're not here for a short run. We want, you know, I'm third generation watchmaker. My grandfather started business in 1951. That's 70 years ago. Mm. You're going to be a fourth generation watchmaker and machinist and, and your daughter, hopefully your son, <laughs> will have something to continue. I love this. And, but if you don't have that heritage, be the first one, start mm. your own heritage. There's nothing wrong with starting your own heritage today. And, and that philosophy is, is that material, uh, material manifest manifestation of your philosophy as a brand is very important. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's what will be, how is this watch going to be treated and respected in 100 years from now? Mm -hmm. Is it going to keep time at, at all? You know, these the, are the important questions. So this was this was our starting point. Of course, obviously we needed 40k, 40 mil case size, automatic stainless steel with a calendar, and we started our journey with the movement, sourcing the movement. Yes. So I went to Switzerland to EPHA uh, fair, uh, looking for an engine for Mark One, yes. for mechanism, and unfortunately there was not too much available mm -hmm. because well the supply of movements was restricted by ETA who we previously used for the Rebelde line we used their Unitas movement 6498 and they no longer were willing to supply or at least they started not to supply their um, their their movements to individuals so if you were Small not makers, if you yeah. were not part of the swatch group you didn't get their movement and you had very few watch making companies or movement making companies really uh, that could fill that vacuum so what ended up happening was the the, the very few established uh, movement makers in 2016 17 18 now there are a few more but the very few that were established got all of the business that was uh, kind of left to the wayside by ETA. It was much easier, my impression at the time, was, it was much easier to find a maker, small maker, mm -hmm. specialist, and get your hands on two billion or something mm. complex. That's right. Rather than your straightforward automatic uh, uh, caliber that would be as good as ETA at least, if not better. You could easily, or oh well, with ease, buy a... 10 to 20,000 Swiss franc to be your movement. Yep. But to spend, to, to, sorry, to buy a automatic sweep secondhand, simple time and in, in calendar function movement. Uh, there wasn't much. It was nearly impossible. It was nearly impossible. And I was happy when we discovered Soprod. Mm -hmm. uh, Soprod is a, is a true maker. We, we, after the fair, we went to the factory and they show us everything, mm -hmm. how they make from design to manufacturing of individual components to test assemblies, quality control, and it was very impressive. So uh, I was also expected to pass their test. Mm. Uh, it's a serious business and they didn't want to start doing business just by you know some ambitious maker. And the good thing is we had the record and it did help that I'm a watchmaker and I know my stuff and, and I passed the test uh, to mutual satisfaction and about 18 months later we got our first movements from Switzerland. It's a Soprod M100. In the meantime we started designing a case and dial and maybe a tip now for, for people who want to get into design. <laughs> yeah. If you're designing a watch you, you really have to start with the software. Well, outside of the sketch, outside of the idea, you, if you talk to anyone, even if it's in Hong Kong or in Switzerland or wherever else to design a case or to, to make your case or to make your dial or to make your hands, you have to have a technical drawing. 
Um, and that's something that we learned with the Revelda series, and it was a seamless transition to make the next case or next dial or next um, uh, ha- set of hands. And it was um, absolutely crucial that we had, you know, the classic like illustrator programs for the, the, the maybe the aesthetic lookout uh, layout, Design, yeah. and then you had you had to have SolidWorks to assemble this 3D model to kind of look at it in three dimensions to see if it works before you invested all the money into making. Not only money, but time. You know, it can yeah. take nine months before you, you reach your, uh, sorry, you receive your uh, prototype, you know? You have to prove to a maker, a component maker, uh, that you are worth talking to, that you know yes, what you're talking yeah. about, that you already t- undertook those preparation steps. Correct. Uh, setting up a, a, a software uh, a station, mm-hmm. your ability to draw, your ability to design, your ability to understand tolerances, mm-hmm. your ability to translate, you know, uh, uh, what you want into uh, 3D drawing that will be a very exact representation of your ideas. I'll tell you why that's so important, because a technical drawing... Uh, engineering approach to the design side of the watchmaking is absolutely critical because it, it lays out to AT your expectations. So a big brand who makes dials, for example, has no interest in working with someone who does not even know what they want. Yeah. So if you give them a napkin drawing and say, hey, can you make this? They can make it. That's not a problem. But if it's going to align with your expectations, it's a completely different story. You won't be taken seriously. You won't be taken seriously. But it, and, that, and that's because they, they will see that you don't even know what you want. Yeah. Anyway, so we, we started off designing while we were waiting for the uh, movements to arrive. Mm. Um, but was it as simple as just putting everything together when it all arrived? Or did we face any challenges? Well, we, 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 have, we made three mistakes okay. with Mark I. Well, you made three mistakes. I made, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to take a full credit for all three mistakes. Um, I made three mistakes with Mark I. First mistake was trivial. But, you know, I have not came across that problem before. And it was a new thing. Uh, with previous designs, we had a flat crystal. Mm-hmm. And reflection mm-hmm. was not a problem. Mm-mm. With the flat crystal, it reflects only in one angle. Mm-hmm. Fine. Mark I uh, has a dome crystal. And when the first crystals and cases and dials arrived for test assembly, I realized that I made a big mistake for not having anti-reflective coating on a crystal. Mm-hmm. And it looked awful. Mm-hmm. You couldn't tell the time. You couldn't. You could not almost see anything. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. So we had to do something about anti-reflective coating. But anti-reflective coating is a big problem for every brand. Yeah. If you Omega, if you Breitling, if you no matter who you are, uh, anti-reflective coating is a layer that is applied on a crystal from both outside and inside. Uh, but for that layer to stick on a sapphire crystal, we still don't have a technology that is 100% scratch proof or scratch resistant. Fundamentally, they're two separate uh, materials. Even though that the even though the reflective coating is very thin, it's still a material yep. that, that is bonded to the crystal. And the because it's so thin, just from a physical perspective, it is it's able to be removed. Um, and we, we don't have the way to bond those two materials together properly um, for an infinite amount of time, for an infinite amount of use. You know? yeah. Funny thing is, that was never an issue on a plexiglass, on a plastic crystal. Yeah. Yeah? But with the sapphire crystals, yes. So anti-reflective coating, I made a decision that we will have anti-reflective coating underneath the crystal only. Mm-hmm. Uh, to prevent scratches, you know, forming on an outside layer. And again, after three, four months and more money, you know, down the drain, uh, it turned out that that second attempt was less than satisfactory. Mm -hmm. There is no way that a single layer 
uh, would be good enough. Uh, I've done a lot of experimental tests, trying different light, different angles, different this and that, trying to convince myself mm. it might work, it didn't. So we have to redesign, we, we'll, we have to order new crystals with a double anti-reflective coating. We lost about six months in, in mm. that project. And I think that was more painful than money itself. Mm. But yeah, learn from our mistakes. If you have a dome sapphire crystal, it has to be double coated with anti-reflective mm -hmm. coating. Mm -hmm. And the second? The second mistake was I put too much faith in <laughs> other people. Yeah. Uh, we, with the previous Rebelde style uh, line, we have defined dial and hands. Uh, not only shape-wise and style-wise, but the dial itself was matte dial. Maybe we can put a picture up. Yeah. Yep. It was a matte <laughs> dial, which... Uh, I like that old tritium numerals on, printed on directly on matte surface. You, you, the best example of that, again, are, are Rolex Submariners from 1960s and 70s, those matte dials. I just love them. To, to me, they look great. And this is what, what the first uh, uh, line of our watch is, just a, just a luminous material printed directly on dial, on a matte dial. These dials are very sensitive, and just think of it as a, as a, as a snow, mm. fresh snow that you cannot really walk on. You, you touch it in, inappropriately and it will leave permanent mark on a dial. But they look beautiful, and uh, uh, this is what I always wanted. But with the Mark I, we said, okay, uh, our subscribers and followers, we're putting this uh, project uh, up to you as a, as a challenge. If you like to design a dial for our Mark I watch, you're welcome. And we will, I think we offer a $1,000 reward. That's right, yeah. And I think we got between 15 and 20 applicants, applicants or submissions or, or, or ideas. And because I was locked in that kind of promise, I, I made a promise that I will pick the winner and I will reward the winner $1,000. I kind of, you know, honestly, I didn't like any of them. Mm. But that was a personal thing. Uh, we, we, we had a winner. We, we did a part. And we went to the next step of uh, doing a, a, a first uh, prototype batch run with that winner dial uh, mm -hmm. design. And when that, I remember a day when that, those uh, hands and dials arrived. Shocking. I was devastated. Mm. Because not that something was terribly wrong. It was a good design. But it wasn't what I really wanted. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't what I really felt like. It, it something was was not quite right. So we went back to our original matte dial with the luminous material, like sort of old tritium color uh, look, and it worked. But we again lost a bit of money, and we lost another lot six of time. months. Yeah. Another six months on, on, on that. The third mistake, which I cannot take a blame for, <laughs> because it wasn't my fault, was uh, again to do with the Swiss. So when we went to Sopra, then we said, okay, we want... Uh, first, first batch was 200 movements. We want them um, to uh, top quality finishes. Then it has to look good. It's a see-through case back watch. We want them, you know, nicely decorated, uh, Geneva stripes, uh, all that, you know, engraving. And they said, fine, uh, do you want them also COSC? COSC is a chronometer standard. Uh, certification. Certification, a guarantee in a way that watch keeps time within certain, you know, a few seconds a day, minus four, plus six or better often better than that uh, we can do that for you we can we can we can once we make movements we can send them to uh, certification office and you will receive a COSC certificate oh I said fantastic why not let's do it uh, that was extra you know charge for that and we needed to order more movements just in case that some movements don't pass the test and Probably about 12 months after the uh, production commenced, movements were kind of ready. 
to be sent to a COSC certification office in Switzerland. We got a call from uh, someone in Switzerland saying, in order for us to certify your movements, you have to register your brand in Switzerland. Mm. <laughs> okay. That didn't sound like a, too much of a challenge. I went online. You can find a, a trademark, trademark lawyer in Switzerland and for 1,000 Swiss francs, he will do it in three days. So I said, yeah, we will, we're going to do that. No problem. We, we hope that, hope, you know, we pass that hurdle. And there, there was not, no, no, no much news Another month or so passed, and they said, another phone call said, where are you going to assemble those movements? In Switzerland or in Australia? And I said, no, in Australia. We are based in Australia. We design. We have 11 makers who make components. Those components arrive to our office in Sydney, and I will assemble them myself, so the watch will be assembled in Australia. And they said, well, in that case, we are not going to certify your watches in Switzerland. Mm. I said, well, you don't have to certify my watch. You just have to certify a movement. Provide exactly the same service that you provide to Bratling and Rolex and everyone else. That's all I'm asking for. But unfortunately, for the fact that we are Australian brand and that the watches are assembled in Australia, we couldn't get COSC certificate. However, the movements themselves were... To that grade. To that grade. Hmm. So was that a mistake? It wasn't a mistake. It was kind of, you know, a little bump on the road, a hurdle. Yeah. But don't assume anything, you know, do your mm. research. If I've done my research a little bit better, I probably save a little bit of a grief there. Uh, was Mark one success, Josh? <laughs> I think so. I think in the first sort of six <laughs> months, we sold oh, maybe a hundred, hundred watches, something like that. Well, it and wasn't, it was just the volume that was important no, to me. For that's us, right, yeah. it was, we, what was the question that I wanted to answer for was after we ship 100 watches, first yes. 100 watches, how many of those watches will return back to workshop? And you have to, I mean, this is, this is fair. That happens to any product, any watch brand. Mm -hmm. And you won't find that data readily available online. Yeah. Uh, Rolex is not going to tell you how many watches are returned back under guarantee. Mm -hmm. A Mercedes is not going to tell you how many uh, brand new Mercedes cars are returned back within a guarantee. Uh, it's, this is something you just have to, you know, live with, yeah. live with and, and compensate for. Be prepared for. Yes. So this is, this is the fact, and I'm, I'm happy to disclose this out of first 100 watches, only two came back within a year with the problems mm -hmm. and issues. And within two and a half years, now only one more watch came back. So we had in we'd have three watches coming back to workshop within two years, which is uh, uh, success. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. and not only those watches were returned back. I can tell you what was the problem with the first one. The first one that came back has a broken uh, roller jewel on a balance wheel. That if you're a watchmaker and, and you're you're listening to this, you 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 say, wow, that's rare. And that is extremely rare mm. for watch to happen. It wasn't a shock. I think it was just a shellac. Uh, got loose and, and jewel came out. Uh, but that is an extremely, extremely rare thing to happen. Yeah. Uh, but it was easy fix. You know, I didn't even want to re-glue the uh, <laughs> roller jewel. I replaced the balance complete and that, that was done. Pretty much while, while, while you wait. The second problem was one loose screw, the clamping screw. Mm -hmm. And in our design, you do have three clamps that hold the movement in place inside of the yes. case, which is a common way, like similar mm -hmm. watches of, of, that use similar movements have the same design. Uh, loose screw. That's why the watch came back. You take the case back, see a loose screw. So what is fantastic? I'm happy about, I'm, I'm not, I don't care how many watches we sell, mm. but I'm happy that as a repairer, I have easy job. Mm. And, and our service department is the, everyone wants to work in a service department because there's nothing to do. Remember that photo of uh, our first apprentice, you know, sitting yeah. with his uh, <laughs> yeah. feet on a bench, yeah. you know, reading a book. There was nothing to do. Yeah. I mean, he was doing, all, clearly, it was a joke. He was doing other, other things. <laughs> but we, our watches don't come back. Yeah. Uh, 
a testimony, I guess, to design and, and to the way they put together. So I, I think we, we cover a fair bit on, 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 uh, in this uh, Mark I story. Uh, oh, there, there were also highlights. Another highlight uh, was the uh, fact that uh, leather strap, we wanted something different this time. Mm -hmm. So we approach uh, a young uh, leather artist, James Young, mm -hmm. uh, from Northern Territory. And we said, James, we want you to make uh, a kangaroo strap for Mark mm -hmm. One. So assembled in Australia. With uh, an Australian strap. With Australian strap. And uh, I love it. It's very durable. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and soft. And there is a good story behind him because you can find him on Instagram and all the rest. And he's in Alice Springs, which is right really smack bang in the middle of Australia, kind of in the middle of the desert. Uh, and and you just wouldn't expect something this of good, that quality yeah, yes. to come from the desert. And it, and it does. Yeah, if you're looking for something exotic, exotic, yeah, I don't think you can find something more exotic than James Young because he doesn't just make straps. To clarify, he in fact, yeah, he's watch a straps is, is not what he does. He makes boots and handbags and yep. and uh, out of all sorts of stuff. But kangaroo, I think, is is quite an Australian thing to do. And, yeah, um, and the strap he explained to me, I, I didn't know much about kangaroo leather. The leather, the thickest leather you can get is under one mil wow, yeah. thickness. So you got a skin. Maybe one square meter, but it's still under 0.9. So he he actually layered three layers of skin, mm -hmm. you know, stitched them laminate, together, yeah. laminate them, and still, I mean, the strength is unbelievable. You can cannot rip this. There's yeah. no way. And but they still remain soft. Yeah. And genuine. Supple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a part of that, James Young is also the nicest person ever. No, He's okay. a father of five kids. Yeah. We have a lot of respect for him. Mm -hmm. And we are we are happy that he was very proud that he was uh, able to supply mm -hmm. straps. And to this day, he still does for Mark yes, One. Yes. Although we have some others, we have Italian leather straps, we have other straps. But you know, that's a, that's a little thing that that makes me happy every time I see. Uh, <laughs> every time I see Mark One, you know, I, I think of James. Good. Yeah. So, if again to answer that question again, if you to start your own brand, I, I, I can probably give you just two tips. Number one, spend as much time as possible setting your goals. Mm. Find where you want to be. If you want to be Loretti Loretti, be Loretti Loretti. No problem. Nothing wrong with that. If you want to be James, uh, um, uh, George, George Daniels. Daniels, be George Daniels. If you want to be somewhere in the middle and, you know, it's a huge field. field yeah. Find your niche and be, be that person. But do spend time Mm -hmm. doing your research a good idea is yeah yeah but there's a lot of a lot of people out there with with great ideas yeah the second thing is be prepared to do it and stay in it for a long run think of it I, I always think of this if you want to lose weight you know you wake up one morning you say today i'm not you know i'm, I'm cutting on junk food and you will feel great by eight o'clock you know your stomach will start to finally function, you know, in 48 hours and, but it's a long, the long stretch, yeah. long stretch. Mm. It will take you, if you want to lose weight and keep, you know, weight loss, it will take you years, mm. wouldn't, of discipline. <laughs> Watchmaking is not different. It will take you generation or two or three, mm -hmm. uh, because just look, look, look at the, look at the, uh, Brands that you're trying to emulate. If you if you're thinking of how long Omega has been in the business, IWC, Rolex, Patek, Patek. If you want to play in that you know in that league, it's it's easy. Look, it it is it's easy to sell your first watch. Mm. But to sell your second watch to the same customer, that's very difficult. You have mm. to be good. You and just think of it. If you are to sell a watch. To a watch collector who already got five Rolex and 50 other brands, that person is damaged in a way that he expects certain quality. He knows what anti reflective coating is, he knows what timekeeping 
is. He's got set expectations. He he feels the, the he feels winding. the the winding and the finish of the steel, and he yeah. can tell. Well, this is nice. This is good finish, and he looks at it. And looks at the grain and the polish yeah. and the dial. You can't fool that person. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot fool him. You 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 have to offer something that he can take to his watchmaker, and the watchmaker will say, "Oh, that's nice watch." Mm -hmm. Or take it to next level. Take that watch, take that Mark I to Panerai Boutique. Take it to IWC Boutique. And let them, let them you know, comment on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because this is where we, we, we put our reputation to that test. It has to pass that test. And, and probably the last tip is get yourself a SolidWorks. Yeah, solid, SolidWorks. Or well, some sort of design suite that you can... You can do the 3D rendering and, and visualize the watch. I think that's a huge tip, actually. You can do it by hand, sketching on a paper, but uh, you'll waste a lot of time and you'll make a lot of mistakes. And more than that, people won't take you seriously. No, you won't take yourself seriously. Uh, finally, just a distinction between assembly in Australia and manufactured in Australia. That's right. So we've got two lines and we should have really said this at the start, but we've got um, two different projects, I guess, that we're doing simultaneously. And one is manufacturing in Australia and in Brookwell, where we are currently. And that's where we take raw materials and we turn them into a watch. And we are... But not George Daniels method. No, this is an industrial method. So it's, it's actually not dissimilar to how every other... Yeah. watch brand does it in switzerland in fact uh, i think to clarify the george daniels method there's nearly no one and in fact i i don't think there's nearly anyone in the world that continues the way that he does he does it he, not not even the person who took over george daniels no, roger smith unfortunately uh as is smart enough is, to <laughs> yeah well possibly but george george um did advocate to use the best machines that, that, you, can that you can afford but he did also advocate uh, some sort of spirituality be behind using your hands to make a watch. And Roger, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, whatever you want to say, he uses CNC machines. It's not like uh, he's sitting behind his desk and filing away every single part. Yeah. There is an element to that, but it's, life is short. You life can't, is short. Yeah. You know, and the, the Roger has a, has a slightly different approach as well. He wants to make you know more than ten watches per year. And so you have to employ these slightly more industrial approaches to watchmaking. So what we're doing, I'm not trying to compare us to Roger. To anyone. No, not to anyone. But what we're doing is a well-established industrial approach to watchmaking, which is, okay, let's make, in our case, maybe about 50 watches per year maybe. and use the most accurate machines and use... The, the best processes and all the rest. So that's the manufacturing That's Australia. manufacturing Australia. It's a beautiful... The watch looks great. Customers love them, but we don't make any money on them. No, very, very little. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Negative, probably. Negative. <laughs> but what does bring a profit is assembled in Correct. Australia. Yeah. Mark One and Steel Rebelder projects. Uh, these watches that where we use different manufacturers, various manufacturers, Swiss mechanisms. We assemble them in our workshop. We design, we assemble, we guarantee, we repair, we, we, we service. This, this is a commercially mm -hmm. viable mm -hmm. product. We sell a few hundreds of those every year. I think we passed 1,000 mark in eight years last year. So there you go. Yeah. Thank you, Josh, for interviewing me. <laughs> or was I interviewing you? <laughs> no, I just asked one or two questions and <laughs> you did the rest. Okay. And thank you for thank all of you guys uh, for uh, spending so much time watching and, and learning and, and following mm -hmm. us and uh, we appreciate this because I said this so many times this project would not be possible without people like you mm -hmm. who trust us I mean you get a fair bit of deal here right you're getting a very very good product but more importantly we're getting your support mm -hmm. and we love this and without you the ultimate is not how many watches we make and sell is that we started eight years ago with one person and now we have seven people. That's right, yeah. We have, uh, we have year one, uh, two year one apprentices, we have year two apprentice, we have year three apprentice. Yeah. And, and these kids are Australian kids who will uh, look after you 
in years to come. Mm. And I think this is something that you and I can be proud of. And this is possible, thank you, thanks to your continued support. We, we really appreciate it. Um, finally, that shirt, freedom to make, <laughs> right to repair, that's what we stand for. And that's the mug. Uh, mug. <laughs> uh, are we going to give away some shirts and mugs? No. No? <laughs> All right. How about this? If you're Mark 1, if you're Mark 1 owner, uh, we will give 10 shirts to Mark 1 owners. Okay. We will give a few shirts to watchmakers. If you're a fellow watchmaker, no matter where, it doesn't matter where, in Australia, overseas, if you're a watchmaker, right? Uh, we'll, give you, we'll send you a shirt as well. And uh, you will have something to, to motivate you to continue on your journey. So if you've owned a Mark 1 and you've listened up until now in this little uh, video podcast. Send us an email. Send us an email. First come, first serve. First 10. Uh, we'll give them away. And watchmakers, yeah. Just watchmakers, yep. Send us an email and we'll give you a shirt and, and a mug. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.